So this morning, we are between series. We just finished Esther a couple of weeks ago. And next week, we will start a series in the first seven chapters of the book of Acts, uh, looking at how the first church uh, started out and what it means for us today. We'll go through the first seven. But for today, um, I just kind of wanted to do one special message. And I was kind of chuckling because um, Stephanie and I, we, we usually coordinate what songs we sing on a Sunday. We, we, we want to take the message that we're preaching and have it come through the Word of God and have it come through the music. But we didn't get a chance to talk this past week because I was in Seattle for a funeral. Uh, but I was chuckling this morning at the songs that she chose uh, because it nails right on the head what I'm preaching about today. So I was like, oh man, thank you, Jesus. You're awesome. Uh, I was in Seattle last week and uh, my, my cousin... Uh, he, he died early. He was only 37 years old. And so I went back for his funeral and he was adopted. And so as I was listening through the funeral of the preacher, what he talked about, what my aunt and uncle talked about and everything went on, there was just a message I felt this morning as I came back that I wanted to talk to all of you about. Uh, and, and to set this up, um, there was a few years ago, I think I preached, uh, I shared a, a, this movie one more time. We watched this movie called uh, Lion. And it was a a biographical movie um, about a little boy named Saru, who I think grew up in India, if I remember. And he got separated from his family. I don't remember how, but he ended up an orphan. Did anybody, has anybody seen that? Anybody? No. Okay. Well, you might see it after this. Um, Now, even though I was scared when we got the movie because my wife chose it and it didn't have any guns on the front of it. There was no explosion screens. It didn't, you know, you know, it didn't look really excited. And I'm like, oh man, it's going to be a chick flick. I just know it. Um, Not that there's anything wrong with that. Um, But as we watched it, it was quite an incredible impacting movie. Uh, Even though it's not in English, it's this movie watching this little orphan separated from his family and, and watching him navigate this world uh, by himself as he was separated. Uh, Here's a picture of kind of what the actor looked like that ran the movie, and it was based on a true story. But watching this movie, as he worked alone, he he never felt safe. He was always having to hide at night, kind of keep himself from being kidnapped. He was was always on the outside looking in. There would be screenshots of him looking in windows, watching families eat food together, you know, something we take for granted. He was kind of lacking all the basic necessities of life that a family would provide for him. And there was times where he wanted love and a family so much that he put himself in dangerous situations because there was someone who was finally showing him kindness. And it was really, it was like heartbreaking to think about the children in this world who are orphans. But this idea of being orphaned, it doesn't just apply to children when we read in Scripture as we read in Scripture, for there are many adults who live in this world who live like Saru did. They wander through this world looking for love, looking for purpose, a a place to belong, to feel safe, to feel secure. Like little Saru, always hungry for something more in their lives. But whatever they pursue, it's never quite enough for them. It always leaves them wanting more hungry for more. And they're never at rest because they don't know why they can't find it. And sometimes, like Suru, they put themselves in dangerous relationships or situations because of their desire to be loved. Some of you may know and be able to picture people who are in this place. Some of you may be in that place yourself this morning. So today, we're going to turn to 1 John chapter 3. If you have your Bibles with you, I'm going to have the slides up there for you as well. We're going to to look at God's answer to this problem. Not, Not only just so it may place an understanding of hope, meaning, and purpose in your life for the first time, or a renewed reminder of hope, meaning, and purpose in your life, but that so you as well can take this message of hope, meaning, and purpose to those in your life who desperately need it whether you know them now or you don't know them, they're about to come your way. And so for those reasons, I pray that you would give God and his word your attention this morning. So we start out in 1 John 3, verse 1. He says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. 
There's a lot to take out of this, but the thing that I want to focus on here is that Jesus refers to God as a father. When you think about God in your life, how often do you think about him as a father? This is an understanding of God that we must grasp in our lives because far too many of us grew up feeling like God was this distant judge of the universe, of the universe rather, who was constantly adding up our goodies and our, and our baddies, as our friend Matt would say, weighing how we were living our life. And so we're hopping from one foot to another, wondering when the God of the universe is going to squash us in our sin. And now why he is a righteous judge, and we preached on that not too long ago, Scripture teaches time and time again that he's also a loving father. Now some of you may struggle with this concept as God is a loving father because maybe you did not have such a great earthly father. But let me encourage you, don't allow your earthly father who did not measure up to prevent you from marveling at your heavenly father. I mean, look at the kind of words that John uses to explain what kind of father God is. He says, great love. He says, lavish. There's that word, that fun word to say, lavish. I think I'll make this my word of the week. Lavished. It says he lavished us with great love, which means generously, beyond the norm. And in Romans 5, Paul shares a similar thought that's going to help us understand what John is saying here. He says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ did what? He died for us. That by his death and resurrection, we have become children of God. This is why Paul uses the word lavish. Because we've done nothing to earn God's love. He gave it to us before we were even asking for it, before we realized that we needed it. And through faith, as we read in Scripture, as we read in Ephesians chapter 2, we receive this lavish gift of God's love. And I want to make sure before we move on any farther, I highlight this idea of through faith. Because when I, I want to be clear, when I talk about God as a father and that we are his children, I'm not talking about everyone walking around on earth. Because God does not consider every person his child. Scripture is clear that if your faith is not in Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're an enemy of God. There's this utopian view that has just been so prevalent in too many of our churches that God just loves us as we are. It makes us feel warm and fuzzy and accepted, but, but that doesn't make it true. God doesn't love us as we are. God loves us in spite of who we are. And when we put our faith in him and what he did upon the cross and not make him just our Savior but our Lord, that's how we become children of God. Ephesians 2, 3 tells us that without faith, we are considered children of wrath. Quite the phrase. It's a weird phrase, children of wrath. It sounds like how you would describe a bunch of children that got hopped up on too much sugar. Children of wrath. But what it means is that without intervention... Everybody was destined for the judgment of God. We are people who are only going to see, receive the wrath of God. But God. Two of the most powerful words in all of Scripture, but God. He chose to come to this world to save us. 1 John 1.12, it says, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. In other words, for those who put their faith in him and believe that he is the son of God who died for our sins and rose again and choose to follow him, he adopts us. You read scriptures, verse after verse, it talks about how God adopts us as his children. He walks into the orphanage of the world and says, I want to adopt you. And this is why I think human adoption is one of the greatest illustrations of God's love there is for us. I mean, think about it. When two people adopt somebody, they choose to bring into their lives another human being. They have no obligation to this child. They have no connection to this child. They, they probably know very little about this child. And they take this stranger with all their hurts physical and emotional, and they instantly call that stranger family. And then they invest their lives into this stranger. Their money, 
their, their time, their energy, and with no promise of what the child will give in return. So what is this desire to adopt based on? Well, it's based on a desire for relationship. Based on the love that the parents have and that they want to give because they know there's a child out there that needs us. In the same what. In the same way, what God has done for us is based on who he is, the love that he has, and what he wants to give to a world that he knows desperately needs it. And he gave it to us with no promise of what we would give in return. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were enemies of God, he died for us. While we did not know him or want to know him, he died for us. This is why John can use words like lavish. And this, and this is why this, is, this truth is so important. We preach it all the time, over and over again. We need to hear it over and over again. Because when you understand this truth, not just here and here, it eliminates or should eliminate once and for all these questions that we have of ourselves. Am I good enough for God? Have I, have I earned his love? Have I earned his kindness? Have I earned his salvation? I mean, if God died before you knew him, wanted to know him while you were still an enemy of God, if he wants to adopt you into his family, if he's making that offer to you before you even chose to follow him, then how is it logically possible that our goodness or that our badness could ever be a part of the equation? We were an enemy of God, and he says, I want to adopt you. We must get this in our hearts and our minds, but because far too many of us, our relationship with God is based on how good or bad we've been lately. And there's a place for guilt and stuff, and we'll talk about that later, but it's based on that. Am I secure in God? He says he adopted you before you even wanted to know him. It should eliminate any doubt in your mind. It should eliminate that question in your mind of whether you are good enough for God. You're not good enough for God, but it doesn't matter because God is good enough for you. We need to hear this so many times. And even me, I'm a pastor. Like I do this all the time, and I will mess up, and I will sin, and then I will sit there and be like, oh, man, how am I a pastor? Like, I got this wrong, and I got this wrong, and I got this wrong, and I'll start to beat myself up. And there's a place for conviction and knowing you need to improve, but there's a point where you start beating yourself up and, and, and saying, man, I'm just not worthy of God. And I'm right, I'm not worthy of God. But that being not worthy should turn me to praise God and not draw me to just relinquish away from him because I feel like I'm not good enough. But then when I read verses like this, I'm like, man, my relationship with God is not based on me. It is based on him. So I know my father loves me. There's times like that when I remember these truths, I'm like, shut up, devil. Sorry if shut up's a bad word in your family. we, We try not to say that in our family. But I feel like sometimes, look, sometimes we, we get so busy listening to ourselves that we don't talk to ourselves. Man, we sit there and we dwell on how how could God love us? Man, we get this wrong, and we get this wrong, and we just get this wrong. And I believe the enemy, look, man, I believe the enemy just whispers into our ears, you're right, you ain't good enough. He's done with you. He's given up on you. We just listen. We let it dwell, and then it affects our life, and we stop praying, and we stop reading the Bible, and we start going to church because, man, I'm just not good enough for God. And over and over. And it's a big, fat lie because our relationship with God is not based on us. It's based on our Father in heaven. Are you hearing me today, church? It's based on who he is. And when you remember that, then when you mess up, you're like, man, thank you for the love of God that he is not done with me, that he is still with me, that he loved me before I knew him. It turns it to joy. And that's when you can say, shut up, devil. Now, don't, and don't get me wrong, I'm not big in talking to the devil. I think we should ignore devil most of the time and focus on God. I think that's how we defeat him. But sometimes we just need to, we need to tell those voices in our sides that tell us that we're, we're not good enough for God just to be quiet because God is what's good enough for us. Hmm. 
And I hope you can hear him speaking to you this morning. I know we all need to hear something like this in our lives. And his, and his love is so lavish, it doesn't even stop there, that he saved us before he knew it. it. It continues with us in our lives. And we haven't even fully experienced the lavishness of his love. 1 John 3, 2, it says, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. Little Saru in the, in the movie, he was, uh, he was adopted by an Australian couple. And so, you know, if, if you know geography at all, they're not like right next to each other, right? So they had to hop an airplane and they had to fly. And, and you know, I was thinking about, man, even though the, Saru did not get to his final home, he was already experiencing the love of these new parents. They bought him some clothes and they got him some food and gifts. And on the airplane, they were taking care of him. He was already feeling the love of God, the, the, the love of his parents. And we're like Saru. Man, we're not in our final room yet. In fact, I got somebody who's, who wants to really preach a message on heaven coming up. But we're not in our final home yet. We're not in the final place where we will feel in full all the lavish love of God, but we're feeling just parts of it now. And his Holy Spirit and his word and the people that he puts into his life, we're getting just a, a taste. But John says one day it'll be realized. It'll be realized one day. One day we are going to see him in all his glory. We're going to finally fully understand what he is. And in return, we'll see all of his love fulfilled in us. We'll fully realize and experience what it means to be children of God. And man, praise God for that this morning, because when we realize that lavish of God, love of God continues, it carries us through the struggles of this life. I'm talking to a couple people this week. They're in the hospital, and I was encouraged by both of them as they, one of them was in tears, and they were struggling. They said, you know what? I'll tell you, when I get upset and I get angry, I just keep thinking about the day I'll see my Savior. And I'll be able to walk fine. I'll be able to move. I'll be able to hear his voice. And you could hear the tone of his voice start to change. The love of God as he was dwelling on it. Man, we're just getting a taste of what it will be. And when you understand that, it takes you through everything in this life. And it changes how you see it. Once again, because you realize it's based on who he is and not who you are, it's never ending. It never changes. The situation doesn't change the lavish love of God. Your goodness or your badness doesn't change the lavish love of God because it's based on him. It is a steadying force in your life. But on the flip side, that doesn't mean that we go living our lives any old way we want to. Right, Even though we don't f have not fully seen what it means to become children of God, we haven't fully experienced what it mean to, means to become a part of God's family, doesn't mean that there are not visible signs that we're be a part of his family now. Verse 3, he says, Everyone who hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. And everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness, for sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. And no one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. You know, when a child is adopted, there are signs of them becoming more a part of their family. I remember my cousin Kevin when he was born. He would hide food when he first got to my aunt and uncle's house. He would hide it under his bed. Now, not like I used to hide food because I, I would hide stuff in my room. That's because I didn't want my dad to catch me. Um, you know, uh, but he would hide food because he was afraid he wasn't going to get any more because that's what he had experienced. But as he got more closer, when he got, as he got closer to my aunt and uncle and became more a part of the family with his, his two new sisters and, and with me, he started doing that less. He was also disobedient when he first came in. He wouldn't listen to them. But as he, time went on, he started to listen to them. And then he would start to utter phrases that they would utter because kids always speak like their parents do, for better or for worse. He was becoming more like his family. He was trusting them. And in the same way, when we have put our faith in Christ, we, become, we start to look more and more and more like God. 
John's saying that you cannot put your faith and trust in Christ and not become more and more like God. The two don't go together. And this is why John was making this point. Uh, he was dealing with these Christians. They had this group among them that were called the Gnostics. And they believed that you could live in sin. And because it was just your body committing the sin, there was no consequence for it, that your soul was separate. Right? And that's easy. That's an easy sell, isn't it? Hey, did you know that you can follow Jesus and fulfill all the pleasures of the flesh? You can do whatever you want. Remember that old phrase, don't drink, don't chew, don't go with girls who do? You can drink, you can go with girls who chew. It's all for you. And Jesus still loves you. It's an easy sell. We got people preaching that kind of message today. And so John's combating that. In fact, Paul speaks about this in Romans. He says, no one who abides in him keeps on sinning. And no one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. If you continue in your sin, when you've put your faith and trust in Christ, and you instantly know if you are or you're not, then you may never put your faith and trust in Christ. You may have this dolled up version of a God who loves you and just accepts you as you are, and you can continue to live every way that you want. That's not the God of the Bible. For someone who puts their faith in Christ and is adopted by God, they will start to live a life that means being a part of God, looking like God, and doing the things that he does. Now, some of you, I know you go to the flip side here, you feel like you, you're like, I sin all the time, Pastor. Like, all the time. I'm, I sinned before I came in here. I'm sin, I'm just a sinner. Does that mean I'm not a Christian? And that's a great question to ask. Now, to be clear, John is not... He's not preaching perfectionism because if we all had to be perfect to be saved, we would all be doomed. But what he's saying is there's an attitude in your life that takes your sin seriously. You know, if you gossip and you don't care or you don't care what your eyes look at, you don't care about your anger or your anxiety or your sexual sin or any 95 billion sins that we commit all the time, or if you don't use your abilities to serve others. You don't use your money for the Lord's purposes. You, 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 don't, you don't read your Bible and you don't pray. Wait, 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 Pastor. He's talking about doing bad things here. He's talking about doing bad things, right? And that's what we usually think sin is, right? Doing bad things. Well, the Greek, you know, the, the original for the Greek word sin, it, it's like a bow and arrow. That's what sin, it, when it talks about sin, it means to miss the mark. So it's not, when it, when it talks about bow, uh, bow, the Greek word talks about, which I can't remember what it is, but when it talks about a bow and arrow, it, it means to literally miss the mark, not to just take the bow and arrow and shoot somebody, and that's a sin. It means to do anything different than what God has commanded you to do. That is what sin is, period. First John 1 3, 7 says, little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness, which is right acts, right things, is righteous as God is righteous. And whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Verse, nine, verse 8, whoever makes a practice of sinning, for God um, makes it, no one born of God makes a practice of sinning, rather. For God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. Doing confirms being. Doing confirms being. When you do the acts of someone who belongs to the family of God, it confirms that you're, you are a part of the family of God. And once again, I'm not talking about a sin here and there because it's not perfectionism and we're never going to reach that in this life. But it's an attitude of you constantly becoming more like your Father in heaven. And I preach this to people who are brand new in faith, and I preach this to people who have been in church for 50 years. Because you can be in church in 50 years and still not be a part of the family of God. Still not know what it means to receive his love and his forgiveness and his grace and his peace in your life. Because you still see him as a God of judgment and not as a heavenly father. Someone who has a, a part of the family, God has this attitude that, man, my father in heaven, he died for me. 
He saved me. He chose me when he didn't have to. And uh, so I want to honor him with my life. I'm still going to mess up. And when I do, there's consequences for it. But I want to honor him with my life. So I'm going to do what I, I need to do to honor him. That, you know, that means I'm, I'm going to be in his word. And I'm going to pray. I'm going to be in church. And, and I'm going to get people in my life who I'm going to confess my sins to. And then they can hold me accountable all in an effort that I can honor God with my life. And, and when you're making these statements, they're not statements of defeat. Because I don't know about you, but I've never said to myself, I'm going to stop sinning in one area and then I never sin there again. Like, I'll say, like, you ever said, I'm, I'm never going to sin in this area again. Next day, oh, I have never. I make a vow before God, I will never sin in this area again. Next day, oh, man, yeah. Over and over. Anybody feeling me on that one? Okay, thank you. I was starting to think I was the only one. And so I'll meet people who they have failed God so many times, they're just down, they're crushed, and they're like, oh man, I'm just a failure. I'm, I'm not like you, pastor. I'm like, oh man, if you only knew me. <laughs> but this is where uh, another reminder about God as our father, that he's not a God that just adopts us and saves us. He's a God who continues to raise us. We talk about, this is a big theological word called sanctification. You remember those preachers, they'll yell sometimes, have you been sanctified? It means to be set apart for God, but it also means God worked through his Holy Spirit to make you like him. And that Holy Spirit works through us not to condemn us, but to convict us. Because just like any loving father who looks at his sons or daughters says, man, I know what that daughter can become. I know what that son can become like. And I want to do everything I can to help them become who I know they can be. Man, God looks at each and every one of you and he sees who you can become. He sees it. You don't see it. He does. He looks down the road and he sees as you are obedient in the work of his spirit, he sees who you can become. And it is probably a much more incredible picture of your life than you could ever possibly imagine. And he sees it. Just like I look at my kids and I see who they can become. I see the strengths that they have and their personalities and how awesome they can be forgotten. And I see that. And I want to do my best to help them be there. Now, I'm going to mess it up and I mess it up too much because I'm a parent and I'm broken. And we mess up our kids. That's how it goes. But the Heavenly Father in heaven, as we look to him, he's molding us to become that person. And so because my love, my, my relationship with him is based in his love, and because my becoming a son or a daughter of God is based in his Holy Spirit, man, then I am constantly encouraged. And then though I'm, I'm always sorry for my sin, and I feel that conviction, and I want to make amends for it, seek his forgiveness for it, and then change the way that I live my life, I'm not defeated by it because I have a heavenly Father in heaven who's raising me, who's by my side. He's raising you. you he, I mean, listen, maybe you're a harsher parent than I am, but when my kid sins, I don't just say, get out of the house. I'm done. Get out. No, no loving parent does that. They, might, they may feel like saying that, you know, n- not to my kids. I'm just using this illustration, Evan, just to be clear. Not just, if anything, it was about your sisters, not you, I promise. And if they tell you I say the opposite in the next service when they're in here, don't believe them. But none of us say, get out, I'm done with you. Man, we may get frustrated, we may get angry. Our vein, this vein right here may pop out of the neck. But we stick with our kids. And in a greater way, God sticks with us. He never leaves our side. His Holy Spirit is constantly in us, working to convict us and to encourage us. And so that gives me hope this morning. Does that give you hope this morning? It should. So every time I'm down and I feel like God's done with you, I'm like, nope, that's a lie. Get out of here. Jesus loves me. He's working on me. And so there's this balance of the Christian life of you not getting so comfortable with your sin. You're like, oh, you know, it's, it is what it is. Because that's not someone who has a faith in Christ. But there's also a thing of not getting crushed by it that you're not moving forward to become the man or the woman that he has called you and equipped you to be. Hmm. hmm. And and here's the cool thing. And I tell you, this is one of the greatest mindsets because maybe you're more, you know, better off than me, but I struggle to read my Bible. Okay, I struggle to pray. Like, every day, my goal to come in here 
come in here early, and before I go into my office and I do anything, I've told you this a bunch of times, I'm going to pray, I'm going to call down the power of God into my life, I'm going to open up my Bible, and every day I'm like, oh, I just want to go to my office and do stuff. Mm -hmm. That's how sinful your pastor is. That's how we all are. But as more and more as I've learned over the years, and I've learned not just here, but I've learned here that God is a father, then I realized reading my Bible, like reading a chapter every day, or praying to him, or coming to church, it's not like a to-do list that I'm checking off so I can be in God's good you know, setting where he has like the big school chart, like the charts they had in school where every time you do something right, you get a gold star. You remember those? I love those gold stars. They made me feel so fulfilled. I love them. You know, little happy faces on them. Oh, it was so good. Anytime I'd miss one. Anyway, sorry, that's, that's a trauma uh, from another time. But we, we do that. All right, I read my Bible. A gold star for me. I did this gold star for me. But when I realized he's a father in heaven, then I realized, man, when I go to pray, it's like picking up a phone and calling my earthly father. I'm, I'm talking with my father in heaven. Or when I go to read my Bible, it's, it's like reading a letter from my father. This is a letter that he, he wrote to me. Or that when I come to church, I'm not going to church to do my weekly duty. I'm coming to gather with other brothers and sisters in Christ. It's like a weekly family get-together. Some of you, you have grown up Christian your whole life, man. You, 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 you're, you've been going to church since you were far back as you can remember. And, now, and some of you, you're still passionate, you're excited, and that's Awesome. But I, I meet some people and they're like, man, I, you know, I just grew up Christian and so I'm kind of used to it. And so, I, you know, I just, you know, I just don't get as excited as everybody else. As if you, if you would have like got heavy into drugs and then one day God saved you, you know, from that drug life that you would somehow be more passionate about God now. It is a bunch of baloney, rotten moldy, nasty baloney. It is a lie from the pit of hell. The reason that we lose our passion, our excitement, and our love is because we are not spending time with our Father in heaven. Period. I don't care when you got saved. You're seven, you've been in church all your life or one month. It's when you're not spending time with your Father in heaven. It's the same way in our earthly relationships. Man, when you don't spend time with people, the relationship doesn't grow. Now, one thing I've noticed like, about my father, I've had my father my whole life. I guess I didn't need to express that. That's probably pretty common. Yes, I had my father. I guess that's pretty normal. Okay, I've had my father my whole life. But as I've gotten older and I've learned to ask new questions about my dad, I've learned to appreciate new things about him, new stories that he would share with me that he never shared before, new insights to his strengths and his weaknesses. Now, if I never had those conversations, if I never asked them those questions, I would have never learned those things about him. I would have just been left with the views that I had a long time ago of him. And it's the same way with us in our relationship with God. Some of us, that relationship grows dead because we're just not learning and appreciating new things about our Father by reading His Word and by praying and by joining together and serving with other saints. I'll tell you right now, that is what it is, hands down, period. It ain't you've been in church too long. It ain't you've grown up with the faith too much. It's none of it. It is the fact that you are not in a constant relationship with your Father in heaven, Period. Not then, and, 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 and some of you are like, well, I read my Bible every day. Well, it's great, but if you read it like a newspaper, that ain't going to do it. If I just, my dad writes me a letter, I go, uh, that's not going to infect me. If I stop and I say, okay, man, what is God saying to me? What is my father saying to me? Let it infect my heart and guide my life. That is where I learn the appreciation out of it. Sometimes we read the commands of God, but then we don't do the commands of God. And I tell you right now, in my life where I've grown and learned the most is when I've actually done what he has told me to do, especially when I don't want to do it. You ever read something in the Bible and instantly a thought comes in your mind and you know you need to go do that with somebody and you're like, nope, I don't want to do that. I hate that when that happens. Like you know you have unforgiveness with somebody or you need an enemy you got to go love and you read a verse and it tells you to do that. And I mean, literally the moment you read the verse, their picture of who they are comes in your mind and you're like, Ugh! I don't want to do that. Maybe it's just me. But as I, when I do, and I'm not always obedient, but when I do and I step out in faith, I'm like, man, look what God did. 
Not based on how they always respond, but just how he molds and changes my heart. It gives me a greater appreciation for my Father in heaven. And when I do that, then it makes me want to read a little bit more, or pray a little bit more, or be in church a little bit more, or serve a little bit more. And then I still don't get it right all the time, but the next time I follow through, and the next time, and the next time, and the next time, and the next time, until he becomes more infused in my life. I was about to say until I can't get enough of his word, but I got to be honest, it, I still struggle with reading my Bible. I, we always will to some degree, but the more that we are getting into his word and following and doing what he says, the passion in us will grow. And it's an amazing thing. So I want to encourage you this morning. I don't, and listen, I don't care if you heard this message a hundred times. You need to hear it a thousand. You have a father in heaven who loves you. He doesn't love, I'm not talking about just everybody around you. I'm talking about you. He sees you individually separate from everyone else. And he says, look, that's my son. That's my daughter. I have such incredible plans for them ways that they are going to touch other people's lives, they have no idea. They wouldn't believe it if I told them. And as they come to me, they look to me, and they listen to me, they're going to see things about me, things about themselves, they thought they knew, but they didn't know fully. And as you look back over your days and your weeks, in your months, in your years, you will see the faithfulness and the love of this God lavishly poured over you. And that is my prayer for each and every one of us this morning. For our benefit and for his glory, that through us, many more will call upon the name of the Lord.